Hey, everybody, this is Scott Schimmel. I'm the co-host of the Dream Big Podcast with Bob Goff and Friends, and I'm here, surprise, surprise, with Bob Goff. Hey, everybody, I hope it's been a great week, and I'm really looking forward to you hearing from our friend, Mike Foster. Mike is such a good guy, and we're going to be talking about setbacks. Yeah, I know for me, setbacks happen all the time, obviously, but some are bigger than others. Yeah, they come in like small, medium, and large, don't they? Like you could have a small setback. When uh, we were when we were first trying to start our work in India, I remember we could import tea. Like what a great idea! Oh. So I ordered thousands of boxes. We put our name on it and all that, and we got the call from customs. They've arrived. It didn't have the sticker that said "Made in India." Oh no! <laughs> I literally sat down in the customs warehouse for three days putting 10,000 no. Made in India stickers oh on everyone. Now, that that was a little bit of a setback. Uh, I was disappointed, but it didn't involve like emotions. It didn't involve my character. It was just yep, like yep. not understanding that you had to say that tea came from India. So what's going to happen for all of us is that there'll be setbacks that are small, medium, and large. And what do you do with the bigger ones and uh, that the come in no better person to talk about than the mic? Yeah, how do you know, Mike? You know, we've been friends for years and years. He was a guy that I'd heard about before I met him. Mm -hmm. And so I finally, I'm like, oh, wow, you're Mike Foster. Yeah. And this is a long, long time ago. And we've just become really close friends. And among those things is that we've had the candor to exchange ideas about not when it just went great, but what did we do when the wheels came off? Yeah, and he's got a lot of experiences, great insight and wisdom we're thrilled for you to listen into the conversation with Bob Goff and Mike Foster. Hey, everybody. I am so glad that we're with a dear, dear friend, uh, Mike Foster, today. Mike, welcome on board. Hey, Bob. I can't believe I get to spend some time chatting with you. Yeah, we've You're spent a lot of time. We teach friend. a uh, failure class together. Yes. We've done that many, many years um, at not only Point Loma Nazarene, but then you come up as an adjunct professor with me at Pepperdine Law School, and I we know. just talk about when it didn't work. And so today what we're talking about is expecting setbacks. Uh, what we've, for those of you just uh, jumping in uh, this framework of ideas we've talked about uh, up until now, we've had different friends uh, on the podcast. Uh, first was to pick a big ambition. Uh, next, explore an opportunity, like you know what you want, Go find a, an opportunity to do that. The third thing we talked about was clearing the path, like what's getting in the way, what limiting beliefs, what's getting in your way of getting there. Number four was to take action, and that's pretty self-explanatory, but this one is to expect setbacks, that it just doesn't always go the way that you hope. Has that happened to you? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> yes, I'm not big on tattoos, but I want to put that one on my face. Like expect setbacks, expect setbacks. so that you're not surprised when things go wrong, either big or small. It happens to us uh, all, but it's what do you do uh, when the setback occurs? Instead of having it um, uh, paralyze you, but what if this is something that launched you? I, I would tend as a flaming seven on the Enneagram to be say like, isn't this terrific? <laughs> when it actually isn't as the smoke is rising from our home that literally burnt to the ground with everything we loved in it. Um, but to, to expect that there'll be these things along and not to make light of them because a it's painful, uh, but to say, have an attitude that there are going to be some setbacks and what are you going to do next? How have you approached that in your life, uh, both from like the overarching idea of expecting there'll be some setbacks to how you've actually dealt with setbacks? I mean, I, I, I look at my life and I have had no doubt a rock bottom experience in every decade of my life with uh, moments were completely uh, just leveled by a setback, leveled by a failure, leveled by something that went horribly, horribly wrong. And I, I really, I mean, most of my work these days is around helping people understand that the only way that our, our worst moments can define our lives is if we give it permission to. And for me, when I look at setbacks, when I look at failures, when I look at those rock bottom moments, it is about 
leveraging that learning, leveraging that pain, turning that setback into a superpower that says, I can now, I learned something down there. I learned something on rock bottom about myself. I learned something about God. I learned something about life. And I don't want to waste that. I don't want to um, squander that learning. And I want to use that to help others. Like, that's the main thing. Like, I look at all my setbacks. I look at the pain and trauma that I've been through in my life. I go, this, this is what gives me authority in terms of helping others. And it has increased the size of my heart in terms of compassion and empathy and understanding. And so I hate pain. I hate setbacks. I hate failure. But I also have seen the gift that comes from those things. One of the uh, things that uh, could be easily confused, if you're kind of an upbeat, forward-looking person, and you are, is just this optimism. I'm certainly uh, an optimistic guy. But sometimes, if you don't pause to say, that was actually a setback, that actually really hurt me. It actually wounded me for a period of time. And I'm going to do those things that'll help me not only understand what happened, kind of murder board what happened when it arrived, but to not get stuck there, but to learn. And to, to your point, to say, how can this help me go further in the relationships that matter to me the most with more authenticity? To say, because it will be, if you uh, skip over the sadness that comes with the a big private failure or even bigger public failure, um, then you miss out on some of the opportunity to actually grow and have people realize that you're super real. And they go like, wow, that was a, that was a big one. And if we're quick as I am to say, oh, whatever, don't worry about it. Everything was great. Then you actually miss out on some of the good stuff. I wonder what makes a guy like me and maybe some of our listeners do that. What do you think? Well, I think uh, I always, when I'm meeting with people or counseling people or working with people, I always, I always think, you know, we I think Brene Brown says this, that the two basic needs that we need in our lives are to be loved and to belong. And I think sometimes when we think about our failures, we see that as a possibility that we would be rejected or kicked out of the tribe or no longer belong if people really knew about our darker side, our weaknesses, our failures. And so for me, I think it's easy to sort of protect, censor our story or spin our story a certain way so we would be more acceptable. But one of the things that I actually, one of the gifts that comes from setbacks is you are freed from no longer having to manage your reputation. My reputation went out a long time ago, like me trying to be the perfect guy or have it all together guy or um, do everything right guy. I, I screwed that up. I, that Whatever picture that was that I wanted people to uh, see of me, uh, they saw my failure. I've, I've had major public failures and, you know, it, it releases me to live a life where I can just be Mike. And Mike is a combination of strengths and weaknesses, uh, beauty and depravity, you know, like all, all of it's all mixed in. And at the end of the day, I like Mike and I like this version of Mike versus trying to be the person where um, I have to pretend or censor or be something that you need me to be versus being who I am. I hope there's somebody in a car in traffic right now that just could just take a deep breath and say, you know what? Uh, it feels like I just got understood because that resonates with so many of us. And part of it, I think for me, is uh, uh, having a lifetime where um, love was either given or withdrawn to manipulate yes. contact. Yes. So if you did these conducts or participated in ways that uh, were perceived as being with the team, then love was given. And if you deviated from that path, um, then love was withdrawn. And so if you have a fear of rejection, having uh, received and had withdrawn love as a tool to manipulate your conduct, then it makes a ton of sense why you want to put a spin on the setback, because if the setback means that love is going to be withdrawn, 
uh, by people that you actually care about, then that would be a really bad thing. And so we don't actually uh, embrace the setback. I don't, I don't know anybody who's been steering for setbacks, but to realize, man, I'm down this hole, let's go do some spelunking, turn on the headlamp, see what's down here. So when you say rock bottom, I'm like, that's how you actually mm. get to rock bottom. You get either lowered or you fall into the pit. Yes. Um, and so once you're down there to say, what if we explore around um, uh, and say, what is it that I could understand in this? The crazy part is this, when you've experienced a setback, uh, oftentimes your energy is zapped. So you don't feel like you have the energy to mm -hmm. explore down there. You're just so beat up mm. by the fact that there had been, you know, a confluence of uh, unwanted inputs. So how could you give some people some um, either permission to take some time to get there or some ideas about what you've done? Because we're going to expect there's a setback, but how do you deal with it when you're on the bottom of the rock? Yeah. Well, one of the things that um, uh, I help people just in terms of whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a workshop is looking at these events where we've had setbacks, uh, where we've had failures as these deaths in our lives, like something died, uh, a dream died, uh, a business died, maybe a marriage died, something died, and it's there's irreplaceable loss that has happened in our lives. And when that happens, we actually have to work through the grief process to come out the other side of the what I call the resurrection. Um, and so it is, to me, I, I always encourage people to, you know, be angry about it, to feel sad and depressed about it, to, um, you know, be confused. Like, those are all very normal things for us to go through when, some, when death happens in our lives. And so working through that and not ignoring that, a lot of people will want to Maybe it was a, a relationship that was, you know, ended, or you've been betrayed by a friend, or something happened with with um, a spouse, or what happened, you know, whatever. In terms of that, what I, I I always heard like being angry about those things is absolutely appropriate. Like anger is a normal reaction to grief and and death and loss, and sometimes, especially within the Christian community, we sometimes we feel like we can't be angry about something, but I think ain't you know touching into that anger and feeling that emotion is important to learn about ourselves. It's important to learn about life. Uh, and that's how we actually get to the resurrection. So I was encouraged to do the process. It's not a, an event. And then we move on with our lives. It's, it's an event to where we get kind of a holy and sacred opportunity to work through the grief process and if we do that process, there is a resurrection on the other side where we're even better and we're even stronger and life is even fuller and more thriving if we are willing to do the process and pay attention down in that cave. It's hard at the time um, uh, of the loss or the setback uh, to have that kind of perspective. So all the more reason to start developing that carve that little groove in your brain now and start going Grand Canyon. Yes. That's the whole idea of having a framework to deal with this. So when you get to the setback, you can identify this is a setback. And instead of punching a hole in the wall or saying something hurtful to a friend, that you could say, this is the setback. I want to like compose myself and to say, are there something here that can help me to grow? Is there something in here for me to learn? And then don't rush the answers. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes we're just trying to find a shelf to put everything. So we rush to put it on an old shelf and we say, this is that. And really, actually, this is all new turf because you've changed. The circumstance hasn't been one you've encountered before. And you might have to uh, build a new shelf. For that and it's going to oh. take a while. So get some lumber. <laughs> yes. Don't hit anybody with it. To say I actually need a little bit of time alone to figure out how did this come to pass and how am I going to respond to something that was the opposite of everything I wanted? Uh, am I going to? 
if I'm feeling rejection, is that accurate? Mm-hmm. Or is that something in me uh, seeing uh, rattlesnakes under bushes that aren't there? Um, is this me uh, being selfish? Am I going to make it all about me and just give everybody swarm around me because I'm the victim now yeah. and I want to actually soothe all of these things in my life yes. that are missing by like g- going big time victim and saying there, am I going to address this by getting all cerebral? And just getting into like, this is how synapse works and whatever an amygdala is. Like, I don't know. (laughs) None of those sound as good as just getting a friend and saying, man, I just got my buns handed back to me today. (laughs) I just had a really bad, bad day. And can you help me make some sense of this? The best idea isn't to give people advice, is to give them a hug. Tell me about that. What's our response when our friends have had a setback? Because uh, some of you that are listening want to rush in and fix it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And sometimes the best thing to do is to just say, man, I am three feet away from you, or I'm sitting at your feet, and I'm not going to move. I... I look at my own story and, um, you know, I've had, had these setbacks and, and it's all the way from me being a victim, but also me being a perpetrator. Uh, you know, I was, I was sexually abused as a a child. That was certainly a setback and ripple effects of that and your identity and who you are. I was involved in a boating accident where I'm behind the wheel of a boat and, uh, ran over another skier in the water, you know, permanently disfiguring him. I was the driver of the boat. It was an accident, but still I was I was the perpetrator of that harm. And I was not the victim there. I was the guy behind the wheel. I've had uh, business uh, ventures that were invested thousands, actually $130,000 in one business that went out of business in less than 12 months. And the only thing that we could take from the business was a flat screen TV that stopped working a year and a half later. And I look at these, I look at these moments of my own story, and there's been other ones where I've been just, just, I mean, those are, I could go on, but I'll stop at those three. Um, the thing that I needed most from in those moments that were so absolutely confusing and so uh, debilitating in, in so many ways, I needed hope. I needed somebody to come alongside me and not fix me and not try to you know, explain something to me. I just needed a sense that it was going to be okay. And I don't we didn't I didn't know when I'd get to okay. That may be a 6 month, 12 month, 20 year process, but I knew that we could get to being okay. And I think that is the best uh, I I have a friend who is a uh, chronic pain specialist with deals with people with chronic physical body pain. And he's one of the leading experts in the country. And he's, he's a physician and MD, and he, he, he certainly has the abilities to sort of do the technical things of fixing people's bodies and stuff. But he, he told me, I was talking with him, he said, the most important thing I do as a chronic pain doctor, and he's talking about like on a pain scale, someone may be at a two, like, and two being uh, like 10, 10 just being, um, you know, great, you're feeling great. One, um, you know, he'd say like, if I have people who are just like about out, they're about done, they're about, he goes, I, I can only get them up a couple degrees, but I need to make sure as their doctor that I do not destroy hope. I may not be able to completely fix them or heal them, but I need to make sure that hope is still in the formula uh, because if we lose hope, or if we crush people's hopes, uh, he knows that he's going to lose the patient. They'll take their lives. And so I, I apply that philosophy to everything, like everybody I bump into, every person I meet, every uh, thing I tell myself is about making sure that I am amplifying hope when it feels dark, when it feels broken, when it feels like we're not going to be okay and we're not going to get through this. I think it's the best gift we give each other. And to ask people, uh, uh, what are the things that you're thinking? How are you feeling? 
Um, instead of like, uh, let me know if I can be helpful, it's a nice thing to say, but at a time of somebody's uh, you know, really big, immense loss, they won't know how to self-prescribe what they need. So just assume that they need a hug, a non-creepy hug. And Bob, you are brilliant at that, by the way. I The thing that I... St- there's so many things I respect and love about you. I, I, I'm, I'm in awe of you. And one of the things that you do so well is you just activate hope in people's lives in small ways, in humongous ways. But you, you have that ability to see uh, what we need before we even need it. And I think those are putting on, I, you know, that's why I, I, I love everything about you. I, why I pay close attention and take good notes with Bob Goff because you have the eyes and the ability to see into the hearts of people and say, maybe right now you just need a hug, or maybe right now you need me to send you um, a pizza or, you know, whatever it is like that is to me, great spirituality. That is great friendship. That is how we want to show up in the world and more of that. We need more of that. Sometimes if you can see the thing underneath the thing, there's the big obvious thing that happened, but underlying that would be uh, an eight-year-old little Bobby Goff scared to death that he'll be rejected and that somebody withdraw their love and he'll feel all alone because they disapprove of what he did. And so the big obvious mess up, that isn't the issue that we're dealing with. That is just the event that happened yesterday, what's really going on. And so as you as we practice that, carving the new grove now to just say, what's the thing underneath the thing? Now, not the obvious one. Uh, one of the practices I know you and I have talked about before, I don't calendar like anniversary dates and birthdays and all that as as well as I should. But one thing I do calendar is one year from somebody's worst day of their life. Uh, And I don't call them up a year later and say, guess what? (laughs) Because I don't want to like be pressing all those buttons. But without a lot of pomp and circumstance, I'll just call up and just say, man, look how far you've come. Um, Because at a time where there was just like so much hopelessness and so much confusion, chaos, and lots of bogeys to track, a year later, that thing that just seemed so helpless, I just want to encourage people later, look how far you've come. Uh, And they'll do the math or not to figure out, oh my gosh, this is one year (laughs) from the worst day of my life. But one thing that we can do uh, with our friends is just keep them closer. Man, if 747s were falling out of the sky as fast as some of my friends and our friends, they'd ground the whole fleet. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, what is the deal? And what the deal is, is the thing underneath the thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's the big mess up oftentimes is prompted by the very thing that you're insecure about. What you desire is love and attention. And so you get off on a bender and then the thing underneath thing gets really complicated. And in a moment of pause, you could just ask your friends, what's the thing underneath mm. the thing? <laughs> They'd be like, what do you mean? I'll say, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, and I think that is, and, and to me, the thing beneath the thing within all of us is, it's so simple. We just want to be loved. We want to be included. We want, it's some of the most core fundamental things of the human experience. And so you don't have to try to solve everybody's problems and their pain and their grief and their sadness. You just have to remind them that, that they're loved. And that's a powerful message because it is our greatest fear that we, because of our setbacks, because of our screw ups, that we are no longer lovable. Yes, or if somebody actually knew who I was, yes. they would flee. Yes. They'd be polite about it. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in the South, they say, bless your heart, bless your heart. as they're moving away. <laughs> uh, but if we are the ones that move closer mm. uh, in the middle of that, uh, this class that we teach at San Quentin, uh, we're up there in a day or two. Oh, great. And uh, it's just like, I, I, I haven't taught a thing to these guys. I just go to learn. Yeah. And the things that they tell me it's just so like i want to like write all this down but they don't let you have sharp objects 
but like I just want to remember what it was that they said. And I get a lot of phone calls from these guys, like about five or six a week from San Quentin. Oh my god! They'll get in, they'll patch me into the line, and uh, and then we'll just talk about it. So I literally just ask them, like, I got nothing for you. Tell me what you're learning. And it's so beautiful. Talk about a big setback, yet the perspective, the clarity that comes from that. And I don't think you need to do 10 to 20 to figure that out. Mm. I think 10 or 20 minutes of personal reflection would be enough. And if you're listening, what you can assume for every single person that you meet is that they want these things, love, purpose, connection, and a couple authentic relationships. Yeah. You just write that down on a yellow stick em. Just assume every single person, whether they are delivering your mail or delivering your child, they want those four things. Uh, and so if you could meet them, and what a setback does is where all of a sudden it's all in play. Will I be loved? Mm-hmm. What does this mean for the purpose of my life? Uh, can I be authentic? Can I experience the depth of relationships now on the other side of this? And all you need to do is show up and say yes. So good, Bob. Man, that is, I I wish I had peace. I have to listen to my own podcast with you so I can write down those four (laughs) things. This is going to be amazing. Sometimes what we'll so critical. Sometimes what we'll do is deny ourselves. I know part of your story was, I think, after the accident boating, I think you denied yourself. You said, I don't deserve to go boating. Tell me about that. Yeah, you know, that's what's to me the most, um, that's why we need to lean in hard when our friends are going through these things, because these these lies get planted and these new rules get planted in our how we approach our, our future. And one of the things that happened for me after the boating accident, and this was a huge, huge deal in my life. I was 19 years old. Uh, there'd be a lawsuit, a criminal court case. Um, the, the, the scene was bloody and gross and horrible. Like it was trauma, trauma, trauma. And out of that confusion, I always say that the worst thing that happens in our setbacks, it's, it's as if a big fog cloud descends into our life and we can't see anything and we are, you know, nothing is clear and you don't want to make decisions when it's not clear and when the fog is on you and friends, loving friends can actually help come and blow away some of the fog. But what happened in the fog in terms of that experience was I, I set a new rule for my life that I was no longer going to be on the water or enjoy the water. And that, that was a natural, I love the water. If you came over to my house right now, there's five fountains in, at, at my house, gurgling yeah, and waters yeah. everywhere. I don't have a swimming pool, but I have lots of fountains. And I, so it's just in me, I, it was such a passion of mine, but because of what I did and what happened on the water, that I set a rule that I'd no longer uh, be on the water or enjoy the water. Um, and the water would now represent this, this horrific thing and sort of this, this, this defining moment in my life of darkness and, you know, just devastation and no longer a a place of enjoyment. And I believe I, it's embarrassing, uh, but I understand why it's embarrassing to say that I believed and lived by that lie for 19 years, 19 years of my life. I, I buried and I, I just lived this new way until finally through the support of friends, my, my beautiful wife, I said like, why do I believe that? Why did I put that on myself? Why did I write that rule? Because by the way, it was only my rule. Nobody else said that. The judge didn't say that. My lawyer didn't say that. My friends didn't say that. I said it to myself. It was a quiet contract I made in my head. Yeah, a 19-year-old to, told a 38-year-old Yes. Uh, you don't get to enjoy the water. Yes, that's exactly right. And it wasn't until I was able to to challenge that thought and say, why do I believe that? Why do I accept that? Why am I accepting what this 19-year-old uh, said is now true of my life? I'm an, I'm an adult. I've grown. I can, you know, that was a, a freedom moment in my life where I just said, I wonder if that's really true. And if we can if we can look at some of the lies or the limiting beliefs that we have picked up over 
the years because of setbacks of how we think the world works or how we think relationships work. If we can begin to lean in that step, back, I wonder if that's true or not. I wonder if it, if I need to be off the water or maybe I, could it be possible that I could drive a boat again? Is it possible that, you know, one of the things that came out of it is I learned how to sail. And this is what I always tell people. It may not look exactly the same way. Like, I honestly don't want to be behind the wheel of a powerboat. It, it's just a little bit much. That's too many triggers. Too many triggers. Yeah. But you know what I can do? I can sail. Uh, and there's no engine on a sailboat. I know. Boat. You're just, if you were watching what is happening as Mike is saying this, oh, my gosh. face just about ripped in it. half and this smile. It. <laughs> it's so, I mean, we live here in San Diego. I love being out on the bay. I love watching. There's just so much beauty. And I'm like, I'm going to stop believing that lie. So I took a, a two-day sailing course here yeah, in San Diego come on. and got my sailor, sailor's license and it, it, I'm just so glad that I stopped believing that 19-year-old lie. And so for everybody listening, so a great way to think about this, uh, kind of do a little internal audit, is why are you doing what you're doing? Yes. <laughs> why yes. am I doing what I'm doing? And so you may be working really, really hard. You say, why am I doing what I'm doing? And there might be just beautiful, honorable reasons for it, but you might be trying to get, uh, you know, the approval of a father who's long since left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you might be uh, having this impression that you're providing for your family and you're working so hard trying to provide for your family that you're actually not providing for your family. You might have some things. So a simple thing is we're like trying to carve a new groove. We say there's a setback. And does that set in motion some behaviors or the thing underneath the thing that got triggered to say, oh, I don't want it, love to be withdrawn, and so I'm going to. Or I messed up, and so I'm going to punish myself by taking away the thing that gives me joy, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. being out on the water. Yeah. Mm. Why am I doing what I'm doing? And if you think through that, you'll find sometimes the return address will be a setback in your mm -hmm. life. Yep. And if you can deal with a setback, now we got a ball game. Yes. And and I'm telling you, find some people. I, you put a uh, a program together and talk to people about it. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, it's a, a workshop called Strongest, and uh, it really is uh, two days a two day experience where people come in and we, we talk about these things. We talk about our setbacks. We talk about, uh, our limiting beliefs. We talk about trauma and how to, how to turn that into a strength and a superpower. And, you know, it's a combination of, you know, instruction, but also interactive things and experiential things. And my, my big belief is I, and you're this way too, Bob. Every person I meet, I see nothing but potential and possibility. And the only thing that is standing in their way is themselves. And so you know, coming, and that's what you do with uh, Dream Big, is two days where you can unlock somebody to give their life a chance to say, you know what? I don't have to be defined by my worst moments. I don't have to be defined by my setbacks. Um, I don't have to have these codependent uh, relationships where I give you love so I get love back. You know, the workshop is all about us living our strongest life, living our um, in, in strongest through living with vulnerability, living with honesty, living with boundaries. That's how we build these strong, impactful lives. And so uh, that's what I'm all about. And so everything I teach, everything I'm trying to do with people is like, I want you to see what I can see and what Bob Goff can see and what your friends can see and to, to release you into the life that's waiting for you. So find your way to Mike's workshop. Find a friend. Make them take you to Starbucks and pay. And uh, and to say, why are you doing what you're doing? To say, like, well, in what area? Well, let's just say in your marriage or the relationships mm -hmm. that matter the most to you. Let's say in your work, why are you doing what you're doing? Let's say with your dreams, why are you doing that? And then you don't have to fix it for people, but just finding the words. That's what I've, having been around you for a long time, you help people access the words, and then we can understand why we're doing what we're doing. A lot of these will lead back to a setback that we had, mm -hmm. and that we're compensating for that by going way over 
I don't get to sail anymore. Yes. I don't get to uh, enjoy. I don't get to rest. I don't get to. You fill it in whatever it is that you've got. One as of you're the main listening. things that I see, and you, I know you are a big believer. Like we get into over explaining why we want something, why we want to pursue. We have to justify our existence. It's like you have a dream. You don't have to over explain why this dream matters to you. Just go for it. Like build it. Like I, I feel like trauma and our fears will make us over explain why we desire something it'll make you want to build consensus around it yes. because you're so insecure about like am i making this thing and then what you've done is actually given agency to billy to mm-hmm. decide your life exactly. <laughs> you know, actually, exactly if faith is a big deal for you i would consult jesus but uh, and billy definitely include him in the loop let him buy you starbucks but uh, but I would say if you figure out why you're doing what you're doing and you have clarity of purpose, mm-hmm. uh, then you can actually take these next steps. And go for it. Mike, thank you. I love you. You have you too, been a Bob. good friend. You know uh, you already have been one of my first calls when things get wonky mm-hmm. in my life. Uh, you've been a friend for years and years. And uh, and thank you for what you're doing, the community of people that you're raising up that are more self-aware and engaged and willing to move forward. Hey, thanks everybody for listening. Well, that was a deep, for me, profound conversation. I'm so glad you brought Mike in for that. There's something that comes when we can get kind of underneath the surface and talk about uh, what happened and the deeper questions about why. Mm -hmm. Uh, For each of us, that's where we grow. Uh, We uh, understand more about context. Hmm. We're willing to do the heavy lifting that comes from from going underneath the surface. And I hope for you, as you've been listening, mm-hmm. you'll say, okay, so what's been a setback? What's been something that's been uh, either small, medium, or large in my mm-hmm. life? Uh, and then uh, what has been my response? And do I need to circle back and yeah. do a little bit more work there? And if you do, you don't need to camp out there to do a little right. bit more work there. Well, he said, our greatest fear is that because of my setbacks, I'm no longer lovable. And that's a great example to what you're saying. Sometimes it goes deep and you need to kind of go there for a little bit and try to answer that question. And bring somebody you trust along with you to have those conversations with. You even said this when you're talking with, with Mike, why are you doing what you're doing? You know, when you have a setback, that's a good question. That's a good time to pause and refresh on the vision that you have for that big ambition. Yeah, our responses actually reflect a lot of what's actually going on underneath the surface for us. Because if you're very dismissive about what had happened, you say, like, that would actually be an unusual response. Yeah. Say, I wonder where that comes from. Or if you just want to, if you have like kind of like a unprovoked, like a a nervous laughter. Yeah. You say, where's that coming from? Because that would be an unusual response to something really traumatic in your life. Right. And so I just say, dig a little bit deeper. This isn't about uh, getting wrapped around the axle. It's about Mm -hmm. saying, I want to get freed up so that I can take the people with me a little bit further. So I can Mm -hmm. take the people that I love a little bit deeper into my life and I can uh, earn their respect so I can go a little deeper in theirs. When you look at Mike's life, he's obviously had some profound setbacks personally, professionally, and it's shaped who he is today. Like what what happens in us as we continue to push in and dig into the setbacks? Oh, well, what Mike became in my life and for countless other people, Mm -hmm. he's a safe place. Yeah. He he He, becomes the city of refuge. He gets it. Yeah. (laughs) Because people say, like, if you've actually gotten real with your stuff, I'm going to run to you when yeah. the when everything falls apart in my life, because if you're willing to be strong enough to deal with those things, maybe you can give me some of the strength to That's deal great. with my things as well. That's so encouraging to me. And I think in these conversations, it's not just about the big ambitions that we have. It's about who we become along the way. Yeah, And then who do you find to travel these paths with you? Yeah. And uh, when you find these wide spots in the road where there's a a difficulty you've encountered, you'll find a guy like Mike sitting there to say, well, let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as you have been listening in, who is a friend in your world that comes to mind that you could share this episode with them? You know, it's going to bring them encouragement as they're going through one of their setbacks. So thank you for listening in and we will see you next week. How you respond to setbacks is going to determine if you have what it takes to accomplish your big dreams. There's no question if you'll experience setbacks. The question is going to be if you're prepared to face them with courage and truth and confidence. That's why this month we have a special giveaway for you. It's a workbook that's going to guide you to make a plan for the setbacks you're going to face. It's filled with exercises you can do on your own or with a friend or a small group. And we really want you to have it. 
There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, did you know that this fall we're doing more Dream Big live workshops? We just can't stop. We're going back to on-site in Nashville again. It's October 11th through 14th. And then to Atlanta, October 22nd and 23rd. We really think there's no better investment that you can make in your big dreams than to get together with a bunch of other dreamers to dig through the framework that we have with Bob as your guide. Get all the information you need and sign up soon to reserve your spot at dreambigframework.com. That's dreambigframework.com. 